The word of God is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, the body of the son of the soul and the spirit, and the joints and the marrow, and it created the thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped and furnished with every good work. If you will, open your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We're continuing our study of 1 Corinthians, and we're looking at the first problem of the Corinthian church, and that is the problem of division. And we're looking at the cause of division. And I want to just do a quick review of the cause of, 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 of division in the Corinthian church. And then we'll go into another reason why there were division or disunity in the Corinthian church. In our last class, we saw that the Corinthian believers misunderstood the gospel message of Jesus Christ. The gospel message is contrary to human wisdom. God uses what man consider as nonsense to save those who will believe the gospel. Man through human reason cannot know God. Man need God's help to know God. Words that humans use and consider wisdom cannot do what the gospel alone can do. The gospel that intelligent men among unbelievers consider foolishness is the wisdom of God. The gospel is the means by which God revealed himself to man. The gospel, the gospel um, reveals uh, God to man. It shows man he needs a savior. And the gospel is the instrument that God uses to save men. But that same gospel message is considered to be foolish by the, in, the uh, intelligent unbelievers. And so the reason why there was disunity in this church is believers were focus, focusing more on human wisdom rather than the wisdom of God in the gospel. And then we also saw in our last class, the gospel that Paul preached was con that contradicted human expectation. Human and their human reason did not expect a crucified savior. How can Jesus be the savior if he is crucified? Paul brought out how God take the foolish things of the world to humiliate and bring to shame the wise of this world so that he alone may be glorified and there will be no reason for boasting. Boasting is still in God's glory and evidence of pride in man. So God take the less promising instrument as seen in the Old Testament so that the glory for salvation will be in him and him alone. The Corinthian did not come from the higher intellectual and influential, influential of the Corinthian society. They were primarily Gentile with some Jews. There were some in the church that were from intellectual society and the influential society, but not many, as the text said in, in chapter 1, verse 26. Now, Paul himself was very intelligent, and he was from amongst the intelligent society uh, of the Pharisee and Jewish culture. But after he got saved, his perspective changed. As you recall, call in Philippians 3, 1 through 10, Paul say. I counted all those things of my old life as, as dung compared to knowing Christ. They, it is nothing compared to knowing Christ. See, most unbelieving intellectual influential individual and in Corinth society consider the gospel as foolishness, but the lower class and the nobod nobodies were believing the gospel. The Corinthians had forgotten how God was using the nobodies. They should not have reverted back or relied on the flesh or human wisdom. They should not have been more impressed with words and delivery of the message, but be impressed with the message itself. Now, that's what we learned 
on last week. We learned that one reason for division is that the Corinthian misunderstood the gospel message and how God operated, how he used what men consider to be foolish to save the lost. <laughs> now, in the heart of our message today, we're going to look at the second reason for division and disunity in the Corinthian church is misunderstanding the Spirit's ministry of revealing the wisdom of God. The Holy Spirit reveals God's wisdom to man. And apart from the Holy Spirit revealing God's wisdom, men, no matter how uh, uh, um, intelligent they are, they cannot know the wisdom of God without the Holy Spirit's help. And so the second reason for division and disunion is misunderstanding the spirit ministry of revealing the wisdom of God. So we will begin this morning with chapter 2, verse 1 through 6, and we'll begin reading at verse 1. And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech, of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I had determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive, word, persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Now I want to start with these first five verses here. Now, Paul in chapter two is going to offer an example of his preaching among Corinthians as he fairly illustrates what the wisdom of God can do in contrast to what the word that humans regard as wisdom can do. He said, when I came to you, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom. Superiority of speech means prominence or excellence excellency of words speech here indicates eloquence in verse one which is rational talking or wisdom here is worldly cleverness or persuasiveness now in the ancient greek world emphasis was always placed on big time orator education or the importance of a skilled speaker or the art of rhetoric education and public speaking. Paul preaching in Corinth was not an excellence of philo philosophical display to gain popularity. Paul said, hey, I, 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 my speech was not to gain popularity. Now, when a, when a speaker then uh, would come to a city, you know what he would do? He would advertise a meeting where he would present a speech normally to praise the city. If he proved successful and attracted enough students, he would stay on in the city. Paul points out that he did not come to the Corinthian like the philosopher of that day who used uh, uh, clever arguments. Uh, why? Because they're trying to get popularity. It is impossible, I mean, it is possible to sacrifice uh, uh, the gospel for uh, uh, cleverness of speech. It is very possible. The truth of the gospel should never be lost or sacrificed, so uh, uh, we should not be so concerned about eloquence or language or the beauty of the style because at times, sometimes we sacrifice the whole entire gospel message. Paul placed no reliance. What he's saying in verse one is that I place no reliance upon my eloquence or my wisdom in evangelism or presenting the message of God. What we're dealing with here in this context is not worldly education, but the tendency of the church to revert back to self-reliance than relying on the Holy Spirit. So what Paul is saying here, I'm not gonna rely on my eloquence. I'm not gonna rely uh, 
upon uh, words of wisdom, of human wisdom or human education in order to win popularity or to get people to accept my message. And that have always been the tendency of, you know, even the church today, you know, people, uh, uh, they go to uh, school for, and nothing wrong with going to school for public speaking, but the gospel of Jesus Christ should never be lost or sacrificed. Or we should never be so concerned about eloquence and language and the beauty of the style of presenting the message where the gospel is law. And then it becomes self-reliance or reliance on the flesh instead of relying on the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse two, for I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. As far as, far as Paul preaching is concerned, Paul only spoke about Jesus Christ and him crucified. He left all other knowledge, he, le he laid all other knowledge aside when it came down to preaching the gospel message and preaching God's truth. He avoided artificial communication that won approval ratings for the speaker or praise, but distracted from the message of Jesus Christ. You know, most uh, preachers, not all, is they look for approval ratings. And as a result, they focus more on their eloquence. Then, and, and a lot of times, and they are, they may have fallen into that temptation that they love to be praised by men, but then they lose the gospel message, and they it, it distracts from the gospel message. There's a time, however, when preachers of the gospel are lazy, meaning in their study, therefore they careless carelessly deliver a message from the pulpit. That is not what Paul is talking about. We are to be diligent in our study as pastor. We are to be passionate. We are to be clear in our articulation of our message. We are to use persuasive presentation when we present the gospel. But what Paul is doing, he is warning again any method that leads people to say, what a marvelous preacher. How awesome that preacher is. What a marvelous, what it should be saying, after he get through preaching is what a marvelous savior. What a marvelous savior, Jesus Christ. But in most circles, people, all they talk about is the preacher. All they talk about is the preacher and the savior just go on the back burner and, and see that's taken away from God's glory. Because a lot of men, they focus so much on uh, the world. The world focuses a lot on ratings and popularity. And so a lot of times we revert back to our old unbeliever in life and we start relying upon our old life or the energy of the flesh in order to get people to accept our message, the message of the gospel. I'm not concerned about approval ratings. I'm not. If one person shows up here, guess what? I preach like a million is in the room. <laughs> And I, and I do that even in the prison. Those guy coming there and three people show up at a church service, you'll think a thousand people is in the room. <laughs> because I'm not trying to get approval ratings, okay? I'm not trying to get approved, but I'm trying to listen to God. I'm trying to listen to God. When I prepare, I'm not trying to get, I'm not preparing with that in my mind. You know, I want to make sure that people accept my message. Uh, uh, I'm just trying to listen to God. I'm just trying to prepare. I'm just trying to give a clear message and I'm trying to present the truth in a way that people can understand and the Holy Spirit gives them ability. There are some people that come to church and even if they don't have an education, they should be able to understand the gospel message. Because if, if, as a preacher, if, if I focus so much on, uh, uh, um, if I'm deceptively, using words to get people to respond a certain way, then a lot of time they're gonna respond to the, my words rather than the message. And, but if a person who is uneducated come into our church serving, they should be able to hear the gospel message. Because if you focus on eloquence, well, they may not have a formal education. 
they may not have a formal education. So once you use that 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 big hundred dollar word, you just lost it. They're like, man, I don't know what that what was that. So they just told, they just tune you out. And and here it is, everything you say after that, they don't even hear what you're saying because you just lost them with them, you know, 20 different, you know, hundred dollar words. And so it's best to focus more on the message, your audience. A lot of preachers don't even think about their audience. All they're thinking about is proofreading themselves. And you got to think about it. Your audience should be able to understand what you're teaching and the message that you are presenting. And a lot of times they don't. Verse three, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Paul here points again at his arrival at Quint in Corinth. He said, I was with you in weakness and fear. This point, so when Paul came to preach to the Corinthian, man, he was filled with anxiety. He said, I had weakness and I was in fear. So this man was filled with anxiety. In other words, this anxiety came from a sense of personal inadequacy or personal insufficient. Paul did not feel as though he was sufficient enough to present the message. But he knew the importance of presenting the message. He knew the spiritual need of the people. So even though he probably was, uh, probably, he probably was epileptic or, or, or whatever, but guess what? He knew the importance of getting this message to the people, so he just went anyway. And you can imagine the people in the audience, uh, uh, they're, you know, that, that's very challenging because um, uh, whatever it was that he had that caused him anxiety was something that can distract a person from standing and take, and it can take away the dignity of that person because people, in the audience, they could be estimating him all kind of ways. So some people believe that this weakness and fear was Paul thrown in the flesh that he asked God to take away, but God said, no, I'm not gonna take that thrown away because I wanna keep you humble and I wanna keep you depending on my power. Well, whatever it was, it was something that can distract from standing and taking away from the dignity of someone in the estimation of other people. Can you imagine Paul standing up there? Just say that, you know, he was a little short, you know, bow-legged man. He wasn't real good looking, you know. Uh, uh, he probably, you know, walked it really, really funny or, or whatever. And, uh, and, you know, everybody, some people get distracted by all that and never really hear the message. And they miss the message. They get distracted. And it probably was tough on Paul to stand up with all these different handicaps because you can't think about how people estimate you. You just do what God called you to do. But he said, I had, man, I was, I was terrified. I was kind of anxiety standing before these people because, you know, people are going to judge it and they're going to have their, their estimation of you. But Paul said in verse four, he said, and my message, and my preaching were not in persuasive his words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. He said, my message was not dressed up to get public approval. I did not design the content of my message to persuade his words of wisdom in order to impress the hear with my eloquence so that they can receive me better. Paul preaching was simply to demonstrate the spirit's power and not a performance. Notice in verse four, he said, my message and my preaching were not in persuasive uh, words of wisdom. In other words, my preaching was not performance-based. Performing for the audience so that I can get public approval. Performance-based pre preaching does not bring conviction. It does not prove the Holy Spirit's power. But the preaching that is done in the power of the spirit is the one that convict men. Verse five, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. So the spirit of one's faith should always be in the power of God and not the wisdom of man. And what he's saying in verse five. Now go to verse six. Now he turned to the spirit ministry of revealing. 
Paul had made reference in verse four of the spirit's power. And now he want to elaborate on the spirit ministry of enlightening the minds of believers and unbelievers alike. The Corinthian believer were viewing ministry different than the way they were uh, to view it. The Holy Spirit can illuminate the minds of men so they can understand the true wisdom of God. Paul gonna give three contrasts. The first con contrast is in verse six through 10. He gonna give a contrast between those who receive God's wisdom and those who do not receive God's wisdom. Verse 10 and 13, the spirit of God versus the spirit of the world. Verse 14 through 16, the contrast between the natural man and the spiritual man. So what he's doing is just giving a contract, but he's teaching on the spirit ministry or revealing and enlightening, enlightening men concerning the things of God. Because he wants the Corinthians to understand the spirit ministry revealing and help them understand what true spirituality is all about. All right, verse six. Yet we do not speak wisdom among those who are mature, a wisdom, however, not of this age, nor the rules of this age who are passing away, but are yet introduces a contrast, a contrast to the wisdom of men in verse five. Paul contrasted the wisdom which he speaks with that of his opponents. Paul meant was simple and clear yet powerful because it was of the Holy Spirit. See, immature Christians cannot understand the deep things of God. Immature Christians cannot understand the deep things of God. Or Christian in carnality cannot understand the deep things of God because Paul <laughs> says, he saying, yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature. So not all believers understand the deep things of God. Only those who are Mature, immature Christian don't understand the deep things of God. The deep things of God require what? A wisdom different from secular wisdom. Those who are mature understand the deep things of God. Why? Because they are habitually led by the spirit and influenced by the word of God consistently over time. So when the wisdom of God is communicated, they receives it with joy. They understand it. Then notice he's saying the second part of verse uh, six, not the, not the wisdom of his aid, nor are the rules of his aid who are passed away. In other words, those who control public opinion are the rulers in verse six. They dominate secular wisdom. The rulers set the standard for what unbeliever who disregard God revelation consider true. Give you an example of that, Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin is one of the rulers of this age. He promoted the belief in the concept of evolution. And that belief rejects scripture, which is God's revelation. But some people will consider Charles Darwin as intelligent or wise. But his teaching and his beliefs contradicts the truth of the word of God on where we came from, what creation came from. In verse seven, the positive side of this here is this, the wisdom Paul proclaimed was a hidden wisdom that God had not previously revealed. He said, but we speak God's wisdom in a mystery. A mystery is something that is hidden, something that is hidden and something that God did not reveal. The hidden wisdom with God predestined before the ages to our glory. The wisdom of God was previously hidden. And what is the wisdom of God? It is the work of Christ in his crucifixion. It is God's secret plan to redeem man and to exalt his son as king and king and Lord and Lord. The rulers of this age, they don't know that wisdom. God has that wisdom hidden from them. Before time, God planned this mystery or to reveal this mystery over time. But in order for unsaved people to know this mystery and understand this, 
they must first believe the gospel. Verse eight, the wisdom with none of the rules of this age has understood. For if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So those who are responsible for Christ's death was from the group of the rules of his age. Those who control public opinion is the ones who actually crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse nine, but just as it is written, things which I have not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God had prepared for those who love him. So verse nine, there are things we can only know through God's revelation. God reveals certain things himself to those who love him. So apart from God making it known, men cannot even know it. Look at verse 10. For to us, believers, God revealed them through the spirit. For the spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. Don't you know that only certain believers understand the wonderful things of God as it relates to our salvation? The thing that God prepared for those who love him, only certain believers understand it. Every believer should and can know and understand the wonderful thing that we have in salvation. Why? Because every believer has the spirit of God living in him. But few believers know the wonderful thing they have and few believers appreciate it. Why? Because few believers are led by the spirit. Few believers are controlled by the spirit. Look at verse 11. For who among men know the thoughts of a man except the spirit of man which is in him? Humans have the capacity to understand the thoughts of other humans. Animals cannot understand the thoughts of humans. Likewise, someone need the indwelling Holy Spirit in order to understand the thoughts of God. Verse 13, verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the thing freely given to us from God. So here we see that the only way to know the things of God, we must have God's spirit. We must have God's spirit. All believers receive the spirit. The spirit helps us understand the truth of God and apply it. But verse 13 which then we also speak, not in word taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the spirit, combining spirit of thought with spiritual word. Now, what is the consequence of this unity of the Corinthian church? So we see that apart from the spirit, men cannot know God. They cannot know the mysteries of God without God's spirit. Every believer has the potential to understand and appreciate the things of God. But as a believer, if the spirit is in you, yet he's not controlling you, you have no ability to understand the deep things of God. See, I can have the spirit, but if the spirit don't have me, then I am hindered from com com uh, uh, comprehending the deep, deep things of my salvation and appreciate them. Many believers don't appreciate the thing they have received in their salvation. Why? Well, let's look at it, and then we'll, we'll close. In verse 14, all the way to chapter 3, verse 1, Paul is going to show us three conditions, three conditions of men. The natural man, the spiritual man, and the carnal man. Now, only one of these individuals have the capacity to understand the deep things of God. And here's the main problem of this unity in this church is the problem of carnality. The believers had the spirit, but the spirit was not controlling them. The spirit was not influencing them. So no wonder they were misunderstanding the gospel message. No wonder they was looking at things from a world perspective, because when you're in the flesh, that's you're going to misunderstand the gospel. You're going to. Uh, um, 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 look at things the way the world look at things. So let's start at verse 14. But a natural man, the natural man is a man without Christ, a man without the Holy Spirit. And what do we learn? That without the Spirit of God, we cannot know the thoughts of God. We cannot know the things of God. We cannot know the wisdom of God. 
apart from the spirit. The natural man don't have the spirit of God. He may be educated, but if he don't have the spirit of God, he can only read the words of the Bible, but he can't interact with the Bible because he's without the spirit. And so an unbeliever can have intelligence, he can be smart, he can have degrees in every branch of human wisdom, but apart from the spirit, he cannot interact with the wisdom of God. He cannot interact with the Bible. That's why when you share your faith with unbelievers, it's foolishness to them. They can't interact with it because they don't have the spirit of God. That's the natural man in verse 14. But the natural man does not accept the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they're spiritually un spiritually praying. So a natural man can read the words of scripture, but he can't understand it, and he can't interact with it, no matter how much human wisdom he has. Then in verse 15, but he who is spiritual appraises all things. The man who is spiritual, he is a man, a Christian, who have the spirit of God, but he don't just have the spirit of God. The spirit has him. This is a believer who is maturing in his faith by walking in the spirit, walking in obedience. So the Holy Spirit is continuing to reveal the deep things of God to this man because this man is walking and being led by the spirit. That's the spiritual man. See, we're not spiritual because we have the spirit. We're spiritual when the spirit of God is controlling and influencing us consistently over time. Verse 16, for who knows the mind of the Lord that we will instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. The Bible is the mind of Christ. And only the man who is spiritual can understand the mind of Christ. Now we look at verse, uh, chapter three, verse one. So we see we got the natural man, the spiritual man, and they, they, they both are interacting with scripture. One cannot interact with scripture, the wisdom of God, but then the spiritual man can interact with scripture because he's led by the spirit. And then in chapter three, verse one, and our brethren could not speak to you as to spiritual men. So he's speaking to the Corinthian, but he's saying, I cannot even speak to you as to spiritual men. So he's saying that the Corinthians are not spiritual. They're believers. And he said, we have the spirit in verse uh, 10. For to us, God revealed them through the spirit. He talking about the Corinthians. But then over in verse uh, one, he say, our brother could not speak to you as to spirit. So they had the spirit, but the spirit was not controlling them. Therefore, they could not even interact with Paul's message like they should because the spirit was not controlling them. They was in the flesh. They was in the flesh. So Paul said, man, I want to speak to you but you're not going to even be able to interact with what I'm going to say because you're not spiritual. Only those who are walking by the spirit can interact with the message that comes from this pulpit. Only those who are spiritual. Those who are not spiritual or carnal or in the flesh, they can't interact with none of this that we're teaching here. And they can be a believer with the capacity to understand and interact because they have the spirit of God living in them, but they can't interact because they're in the flesh. He said, but as to men of the flesh, as to infants in Christ. He said, but I have to speak to you as men of the flesh, men controlled by the sin nature. You are babies in Christ. So they have been saved by five years, but yet they haven't left kindergarten. They are still in babyhood. Why? Because they're not being led by the spirit. And he called them infants in Christ. So they were not able to interact with the Bible because of walking in the flesh. So in other words, their spiritual growth was hindered through being in sin and walking in the flesh. Their spiritual growth was hindered. And that was the consequence of disunity. Spiritual growth hindered. And that is all that was happening within a local church or even in a believer's life, sin hinders our spiritual growth. How do we know that? Look at verse two. I gave you milk to drink. That's the basic Bible teaching. And not solid food. That's advanced Bible teaching. For you were not yet able to receive it. So the Corinthians were not even able to receive advanced Bible teaching 
because they were not even interacting with the basics. So he said, man, I want to I want to go beyond the basic. Y'all been saved five years. I planted this church five years ago. And by now, y'all should be mature. But the reason why is they've been living out of the flesh, in the flesh, and the spirit was not controlling them for long periods of time, so they would remain in baby. Then he said in verse three, for you are still fleshly, for sin there is jealousy, strife among you. Are you not fleshly? Are you not walking like unbelievers? For when one say, I'm a Paul, I'm a, of another, I'm of a policy, and you are not mere men, y'all are following men. Y'all are uh, appreciating one, uh, y'all are being selected with the preachers out of jealousy and strife. And then he say, what then is Apollos? And what is Paul? Servant to whom you believe, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted Apollos water, but God was causing the growth. So then neither the one who plant nor the one who waters anything, but God who calls it a growth. Now he who plants and the one who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God fellow workers. You are God fill God's building. So what Paul is saying here is that I want to take y'all beyond the basic doctrines of the Christian faith, but I cannot do it because you're walking in the flesh. You're in carnality. You got sin in your life. And as a result of that, you're going to lose rewards. And we'll get into the loss of rewards on next week. And that's what he's going to bring out. The result of their growth being hindered. Whenever our spiritual growth is hindered, we're actually losing rewards. We're supposed to be storing the rewards in heaven. That's why we should always be controlled by the spirit. Learning and applying the word so that we can store rewards in heaven. But these believers have hindered Paul from taking them into deeper doctrine because of carnality. They can't interact with the spirit even though they have the spirit because of being in the flesh. Every time you and I sin, we grieve the Holy Spirit and we get out of the spirit and we're in the flesh. We can't stay in the flesh. We need to confess our sin, get back in the spirit so that we can go uh, uh, into advanced doctrine and go from kindergarten, first grades, and, and, and we will never graduate until our sin nature is taken away and we're face to face with the Lord, but we're supposed to be advancing progressively every single day. And we only can do that with unconfessed sins in our life. Let's start right here with a word of prayer. Father, we're just so grateful uh, for you preserving your words so that we can know this truth. Thank you, Father, for showing us that apart from the spirit leading us, it is very difficult to interact with your truth and with your word. And so we ask that you will help us to be spiritual so that nothing will hinder us from learning the deep things of God. We don't want to stay in babyhood, but we want to advance to spiritual maturity because that's where your rewards are at. Keep our minds and heart until we meet again. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you, Pastor. Here. Yeah. Thank you, man. Mm -hmm.